Joanna Marsh, the James Dickey Curator of Contemporary Art, and it's a pleasure to welcome you tonight to the Smithsonian American Art Museum. Um, I'd like to ask everyone to silence your cell phones and other mobile devices um, for the duration of the program. We're going to have a short question and answer period following this evening's lecture. And I would just ask that if you have a question for our speaker, if you could um, address it from one of the two microphones that are set up in the aisles of the auditorium so that our audience tuning in via webcast can hear your questions. Um, tonight's program is the final lecture in a series um, called Art and Science um, that explores the intersection of visual art, natural history, and environmental science. Uh, the series is organized in conjunction with our current exhibition, Alexis Rockman, A Fable for Tomorrow, which is on view in our third floor galleries and um, is closing May 8th, so you have about 10 more days to see it if you haven't had the opportunity. Um, the, the impetus for the lecture series is really Rockman's own work um, and his sort of unique cross-disciplinary approach to making art. And tonight's speaker, Christiane Samper, I think will offer a really unique perspective on the intersection between art and science. Uh, as director of the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History, he and his staff are developing innovative new programs and exhibitions that will bring art into the science museum context. Uh, Dr. Samper is a biologist and international authority on environmental policy. He has served as director of the Museum of Natural History since 2003, overseeing the world's largest natural history collection and a museum that wel welcomes more than six million visitors a year. Between 2001 and 2003, Samper served as deputy director and staff scientist at the Smithsonian's Tropical Research Institute in Panama, which is the world's largest research facility for uh, tropical biology. Uh, in the science community, Dr. Samper is known for his work in the ecology of Andean forest clouds, conservation biology, and environmental policy. He currently sits on the boards of the American Association of Museums, the Nature Conservancy, and the World Wildlife Fund. He's also a member of Harvard University's Board of Overseers and Biodiversity International's Board of Trustees. Prior to joining the Smithsonian, Dr. Samper spent more than a decade working in Columbia. Um, in the early 90s, he was a driving force behind the establishment of a network of private nature reserves and major environmental education programs throughout Columbia. He went on to found the first National Bio, Bio, Biology, excuse me, Biodiversity Research Institute in Columbia and served as chief science advisor to the Colombian government. For these contributions, he was awarded the National Medal of the Environment by the President of Colombia in 2001. So we are very pleased to welcome Christian Samper tonight. Thanks. All right, thank you uh, for the invitation and for the opportunity to be here tonight and uh, talk a little bit about this intersection about art and science. Uh, this is one of those topics where a couple of friends in the audience sort of said, how are you feeling? I said, well, when you go out of your depth into areas like art that, where I'm not an expert, it's always interesting. So I had to recruit help right up front. And I want to acknowledge Jennifer Tafe, who's up here, who's my executive assistant, who conveniently has a master's degree in art history. Uh, so she deserves most of the credit for putting this together. And I also want to acknowledge Barbara Stauffer, who's here, who's helped us with this thing, uh, exhibit as well where they talk, but she oversees all the temporary exhibitions at Natural History, including a bunch of ones I'm going to talk about. So they can answer the questions. How's that? I actually offered to introduce them and let them give a the talk. But anyway, let, let's start. And uh, let me just point out a couple of people were asking me about this image. And of course, uh, one of the things I think we, when we start looking up close at nature, we see many things. Any guess what that is? That is a close up look. To, the, to a meteorite from outer space, a very famous meteorite called the Allende meteorite, which happens to be 4.6 billion years old. That, those are the traces of the origin of the solar system. It just happened to be looked in a way that could be uh, a really artistic expression of nature, if you wish. But before I go into talking about your work, let me tell you a little bit about, about my personal connection with some of the art issues and a few of the things that have inspired me. 
throughout my career. I want to start with this picture. Uh, as was mentioned, I actually grew up in Colombia, in Bogota. And this is a very famous lake outside Bogota. It's called Lake Guatavita. And I used to go there as a kid. I used to climb those mountains, uh, collect bugs and plants, and that's a little bit of how I became a scientist. But to many people that are interested in South American archaeology, this is also considered to be one of the sacred lakes of El Dorado. And we all have, as kids, sort of our museum moment. You sort of think when you went there and sort of what you saw, and you say, oh, wow. Well, this was my oh, wow. And this piece came from that lake. And this is the depiction. This is from the Muisca Indians, the pre-Columbian cultures that were uh, lived out outside Bogota, uh, all the way up to the contact with the Spaniards. And the legend of El Dorado talks about the chief going out in this lake, covering himself with gold, and offering the gold to the gods. And this is one of the, probably the most famous piece at the Gold Museum, run by the National Bank of Colombia. And uh, I think every single kid in Colombia has been there to see it. This is the Hope Diamond over there. Uh, but when you look at it, it's, it is art, clearly. I mean, it's a, this incredible depiction that was made almost 1,000 years ago, showing us a little bit about how some of our ancestors were looking at the world around us. And you can go further back. As a biologist, I became a tropical biologist. And I, one of the things I did is I'd get to go to pretty cool places. Uh, this is one of these, one of the expeditions that I did early on in my career to a place called Chiribiquete, which is in the Colombian Amazon. See a little map of Colombia here. You guys will be here. This is the Amazon, Brazil, Peru. And right here in the middle of the jungle, you have these incredible formations, which are rocks from what, what's known as the Guyana Shield, that are basically islands over a sea of forest. And uh, it's really incredible. This is the biology part of the talk, in that 80% of the plants that are found there are carnivorous. Because these are very old rocks that are leached, and uh, this is the only way the plants can actually get nutrients. But that's not what we're here to discuss. The issue is when you go there on expedition, and you actually go here and you start climbing up these areas to try and get up there, halfway up the face of this mountain, you see this. And these, we think, were, well, clearly were some of the early depictions that were done by the Carijona Indians that used to live in this region. They've been dated to a couple thousand years old. But it really shows us some of the early depictions. I could show you many slides about this, but you can see how so these people were looking at nature around them, whether it was the fish or the harvesting or the moon or so many things, and starting to develop some symbolic representations of uh, some of these elements. And of course, we see this all over the world, all over the US and all over the world. So clearly, our connection between natural history and art goes way, way back. But my other personal connection, as was mentioned, is one of my heroes has always been Alexander von Humboldt. I did found and establish an institute in Colombia named after him. And of course, Humboldt was one of these great 18th century naturalists, uh, one of the people that did everything. It was sort of, they were geologists, mathematicians, astronomers, biologists, you name it. Uh, but Humboldt was in many ways sort of the first real scientist that went to explore in a systematic way the natural world and bring a lot of this knowledge back to Europe. And the early work of Humboldt, this was one of the portraits that was done of him in 1806. This was shortly after he completed a five-year journey that took him to Venezuela and through the Orinoco River. He's holding a plant from the Andes, the genus Tibuchina. But of course, so many of these collections and these things would come back to Europe, and people were starting to wonder about this new continent that was full of these incredible creatures and all of this nature. But the other thing that sent Humboldt there was another incredible expedition that was taking place that had been organized by the Spanish crown by a man called Jose Celestino Mutis. And he was the head of something called the Botanical Expedition to the New Kingdom of Granada. And uh, Mutis was the personal physician to the viceroy of the King New Kingdom of Granada, but he was also fascinated with the use of plants for medicinal purposes, collected a lot of things, and recruited, not only did an incredible set of collections, but established a remarkable group of artists to help document the biodiversity. And Humboldt and Mutis met in Bogota. They had an encounter. But these are the kinds of pieces that we get that are very well known. These are housed in Spain. Most people in this country have never seen them. But there's 
about 35 volumes of these depictions of botanical illustrations or scientific illustrations of the art. And almost all of these plants were completely new to science. And these were the specimens of the depictions that were going back. If you go to the uh, Botanical Garden in Madrid, you can see some of these uh, illustrations. There are actually a few on display at Kew Gardens right now. But the level of detail is quite extraordinary in some of these. This is a plant from the Andes. It's related to passion fruit. It's passiflora. It's, uh, you can see the flower over here. It was really interesting in terms of the way they took the specimens and they, did, they, they would pull together the entire biology and natural history of some of these and put them in a single plate. And I think it was another great inspiration. Now, the work of people like Mutis and the collections of people like Humboldt, as they came back to Europe, remember, we're talking about the early 1800s. People were wondering what was going on, inspired a whole generation of artists to start looking and depicting this incredible world, the new world. And of course, one of the famous people was Frederick Edwin Church. This is one of the famous, one of my favorite church paintings, The Heart of the Andes. And it sort of shows you this majestic feeling there with a lot of issues. For When you start looking as a biologist uh, to some of the paintings, you realize there was definitely a lot of artistic liberty in some of the things that were being looked at there. But, it, but this was the image. This was to a lot of the people in North America and Europe, the vision of this completely new area full of biological diversity. And it was a window into that world as looking at this intersection between art and science. And that tradition of looking at this relationship has continued, of course, over generations of scientists, of artists, of many people, all the way up to people like Alexis Rockman. And this is, of course, one of the paintings that you can see upstairs in the third floor, Evolution, which this does not do it justice if you go up there and stand in front of it. I did it a few weeks ago, and I spent like half an hour just in front of this one painting. The incredible amount of detail was amazing. And then, of course, as a biologist, I started looking at these issues and the critters, and you realize these mixed different time periods. And it's really quite an extraordinary collection of issues. But the tradition continues to this day. And of course, in some ways, this is people like Rockman are uh, doing what Church did back in the 1850s. But let me turn back to natural history and a little bit of what we uh, have done and the museum. Uh, we celebrated the 100th anniversary of the opening of this building last year. So the building where the National Museum of Natural History is found uh, opened in 1910. And uh, this was one of the first pictures. When it opened its doors, it was the United States National Museum. All of those of you that are tied to Smithsonian know this well. And of course, some things have changed, like modes of transportation. Uh, but the main building is there. We've added some wings. But if you had walked into that building back in 1910, 1911, one of the things you would have realized is if you go into where the Ocean Hall is today, that's what you would have found. These were the actual images. This was the building that used to house the art collections of the Smithsonian Institution. And it's been pretty interesting to see. Here's another look. This is the Ocean Hall today. And you can see these incredible collections of murals, all these remarkable pieces and decorative arts that have gone to places like Sam the Renwick and so many other incredible collections. So in some ways, of course, our connection goes back to a physical co-location. And I'd like to think this has actually inspired some of the early partnerships in this realm. Um, other things have not changed as much. This was the Hall of Extinct Monsters, as uh, they like to call it. This picture is from 1930s. But having, uh, we're currently studying the renovation of this hall. And I can guarantee you there are some specimens there that have not moved in 100 years, <laughs> meaning physically the display and the issues there. But one of the things we want to do is figure out new ways of displaying them. And I think art will come to help us in this process. Now, at the core of what we do at Natural History, of course, is a lot of scientific research. And we are fortunate to have this extraordinary collection, uh, which, as was mentioned, is about 126 million objects and specimens. Now, that puts in perspective, when I talked to Marty Sullivan at the National Portrait Gallery, it's sort of, and the entire collection of the Portrait Gallery, or the director of the Air and Space Museum, they deal with hundreds. Or we deal with millions. But the beginning point, the earliest collections that we have at the museum go back to the US exploring expedition. And this was, of course, uh, the famous expedition that took place in the 1830s, 1840s, where the United States sent out this expedition to document the world. And um, 
all the collections from the US exploring expedition, or most of them, came to the National Museum of Natural History, and we have them. But what many people don't realize is that among the expedition were a whole bunch of artists that were brought on board to help document and explain this. And this was one of the artists uh, that was there, Titian Peel, and related to the Peel family, as some of you will recognize. And he was an accomplished artist and the respected scientist. And uh, this was the, these were some of the early publications that came out from the Wilkes expedition, uh, the US Explorer expedition. And this particular volume, which is dealing with mammals and or, uh, birds, was illustrated by Peel. And you can see a few of the specimens that were collected. These are the original specimens from the Exploring Expedition. I can show you uh, in my office, I have a botanical specimen from Australia of a specimen of Banksia that was collected back in the 1830s, which is pretty amazing to see it there and think that's when it was collected. And these are the illustrations in this particular volume that were done by Peel. This was looking at some of these elements as they were doing the expedition, documenting this. And of course, it's another way of documenting um, nature. And this tradition of scientific illustration, which has gone back to the Mutis years, to the US exploring expedition, has always been a very important part of the work that we do and do to this day at the National Museum of Natural History. Uh, we continue doing it. We use different tools, uh, but these are contemporary botanical, uh, not botanical, I know that, <laughs> um, scientific illustrations. In this case, uh, an illustration from George Venable, one of the beetles, a new species that was described. And we have uh, a number of these that have been done. Uh, this is, for example, a detail from Alice Tangerini, who's one of our scientific illustrators, a phenomenal artist, uh, did all kinds of incredible things. And uh, yeah, th that, yeah, that's me. <laughs> that was not that I collected it, but that was actually a, a genus that was named in my honor by Vicky Funk, which was great. A little inside joke uh, here. Let me tell you, at least it's a good looking plant. And I have a good friend in the British Museum who the only thing he got named after him was a tick. So I think a plant is much better. <laughs> but of course, it's not only what we're doing now, but collecting some uh, remarkable collections. And some of the earliest natural history illustrations and the remarkable work uh, that was done, we actually hold a collection, I should mention, of about 50,000 scientific illustrations. And some of them go back to the work of people like uh, Mary Sibylla Marion. Uh, this is one of her self-portraits. You can sort of see. Uh, the way she saw this, but these are illustrations that some of you have probably seen. These incredible documentation of the natural history in the full sense of the world. It's not just the specimen, but it's trying to convey the natural history of some of the specimens that she saw. Uh, here, for example, the entire life cycle of some of the moths, the interactions between plants and animals. And it's really trying to highlight a little bit of this history that uh, where you see this intersection of art and science going back many years. But it's not only scientific illustration. Uh, one of the things that we've always done, of course, is uh, gone out and we've got an extraordinary archive of images and photographs. And uh, this is, these happen to be photographs taken by the third secretary of the Smithsonian Institution, Walcott, Secretary Walcott, uh, which by themselves are really quite spectacular when you think about it. These were, this was taken in 1910, so 100 years ago, uh, in British Columbia. And there are quite lovely, beautiful landscapes. Now, for those of you that are paleontologists in the audience, you may recognize the word Burgish there because uh, it so happens that one of the things Walcott discovered there was what are known as the Burgish Shale fossils, which at the time happened to be the oldest known fossils in the world, which are now dated to 535 million years ago. And it's one of the most incredible scientific collections that we have. The entire collection is the National Museum of Natural History. And these were the incredible documentation of images, notes, and other elements that were done by people at Walcott. And this tradition of continuing to document images in the field uh, continues to this day. And we do things. This is a field station uh, that the museum has in a place called Caribou Key in Belize. And um, we've been doing work there for about 30 years. And this is a photograph taken by someone I want to honor tonight uh, who we lost recently, unfortunately, Chip Clark, who was one of our great uh, photographers. Uh, and one of the things he did was look at these incredible creatures and make them come alive. If you see some of these images of the Hope Diamond, the, the work that goes into showcasing the intricate details of some of these objects in the collection is quite extraordinary. And Chip was a master like none. And unfortunately, we lost him last year. But we also have some incredible 
historical photographs in places like the National Anthropological Archives. Uh, and one of the issues, those of you interested in southwestern archaeology, recognize Nampeo. Uh, this is one of the images in our collections, these incredible historical documentations. Nampeo did some extraordinary pottery from this area. Um, and this is one of her pots in the southwest, depicting all of these elements, uh, moths and other areas. But what you don't rec realize, I don't have to go into the whole story, time to go into the whole story tonight, is that Nampeo, in her artwork, was actually inspired by some of the early archaeological exp explorations and pieces that were found in the southwest. And this actually is a reconstruction from some of the, uh, this was collected by Fuchs uh, earlier. And it turns out that this was the reconstructed pre-contact archaeological pottery that was redone by Nampeo in this style. So even in our archaeological pieces, you've got all these elements of uh, depictions of nature. And of course, I could go on the story in many ways. Uh, this is, for example, just illustrations from Sitting Bull. And so his, uh, the drawings that he did about some of the early contacts and the lives of uh, some of the Native Americans and their battles with uh, some of the soldiers. Um, we've got incredible pieces from the Middle East and uh, a lot of different kinds of uh, ethnological objects. And this brings us a little bit to what's happening today. Uh, this is an area where a number of people here in the audience have been exploring, have been looking at this intersection between history, art, culture, science, look at different ways. And uh, there's a very interesting report that came out uh, just uh, not, not that long ago, done by the Office of Public Anal Policy and Analysis. If you haven't seen it, it's really interesting looking at the collaboration between arts and science across the Smithsonian and look at the full potential and how we do it. Because one of the challenges that we have at the Smithsonian is, of course, we, we've got this complex of museums, research institutes, but getting these and building bridges across them and looking at this and having a scientist come to speak at SAM or an artist come to speak at Natural History is something we don't always do. So in that regard, tribute to Sam for having this series today. But let me tell you a little bit about what we're doing today at Natural History, uh, looking at these art and science initiatives. I want to start with this image, because it's actually not a photograph from a show that Barbara remembers well by Robert Kramer. Uh, this is actually hanging in my office, the Office of the Director of the National Museum of Natural History. Um, and it's a really interesting example. It, it, uh, of looking at objects in nature. These actually are very, very high resolution scans. And it turns out Bob Kramer, one of the things he did was he would go out there, collect elements of nature, and I'll show you a video in a moment tell, letting him tell the story, but he would bring them in and use a flatbed scanner to these compositions of nature. And we had a fabulous show back in, when was it, Barbara? 2006, I think. Uh, oh, the date is there. Uh, and it's really a, a beautiful piece. And I want to show you uh, just a small clip that will tell you a little bit about, uh, let you see the voice of the artist, not the scientist or the director in here. Let me see if I, oh. I'm clicking, right? Jennifer? Left. Left click. Oh, okay, let's go back. Try again. Left click. Oh, right in the center. Okay, let's see if I get it right. No? Okay. Oh, getting ahead of myself. We'll get there. Don't worry. I'm, I'm getting some technical help. With, all right. Oh, bring the mouse there. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's right. Really okay. So this is Bob Kramer telling you a little bit about his work and shows you a little bit of how he would do this in, in the field. And he likes lotus flowers and leaves. You've seen his work. One of the things that always amazes me about the art world is uh, the introduction of ideas. Just through conversation with some of my colleagues, I told them that I was scanning objects. And they said to me, um, you know, Bob, there's a small little nature center over in Virginia where the Smithsonian allows you to go and handle the, the specimens and draw from them and study them as an artist. steered me in this whole new direction of working with natural history objects. Time to go to work. If I showed you a whole clip, you'd see he brings these back into his studio, and he'll start hanging them up and burning some of them, and then doing high-resolution scans. And the results are quite remarkable. 
So you can see all of his images in our website. Uh, but we continue doing all kinds of explorations. Uh, this is an exhibition that was at the museum just last year in collaboration with the American Society of Botanical Artists called Losing Paradise. It's a very interesting exposition looking at multiple artists, but looking all of the elements that were in there were endangered plants uh, found in the U.S. and around the world. And uh, there were, again, incredible insights. The, the one thing, as good as an image can be, as good as a specimen can be, the artist can preserve some of that spirit of the plant or the specimen in a way that no one else can and point out some of these remarkable elements. And if you go to the museum today, you can actually see this exhibit that's there that we do every other year in collaboration with the Botanic Garden. And this is done by our horticulture division at the Smithsonian on orchids. And this year, the topic is a view from the east. And not only do you get to see some spectacular displays of orchids, which are always nice in a cold winter in Washington, uh, but this year, we actually, because we're looking at the East, we collaborated with the Freer and Sackler galleries and brought over a number of elements from the collection of the Freer and Sackler, which are on display side by side with the orchids. And at the same time, the Freer and Sackler is doing an exhibition looking at orchids in the Asian art. So it's an interesting example that can actually start exploring these connections across different parts of the Smithsonian through a single topic, but different points of view. And of course, uh, we know not only do it here, but this is one of the things that people, some people were mentioning. We opened a year ago the Hall of Human Origins, which has done extremely well, but one of the key elements for the success is the work of an artist, John Gertie. And uh, the interesting thing here is that he, he actually def self-defines himself as a paleo artist. And the interesting thing is he did, on the one hand, these incredible reconstructions of early hominins. Uh, like Neardenthos or the Homo floresiensis, based on the best information for forensic anthropology and how we can actually reconstruct these. And if you go to see the exhibition, you can actually look at these and look in the face. And if you want to go further, you can actually take your image and morph yourself into a Neardenthal. And as I like to say, some of us require less or more morphing, but that's a different matter. But the other thing he did, which was remarkable, is these incredible sculptures of Neardenthals trying to recreate their lifestyles. And these are life-size bronze sculptures that are in the gallery. And the impact that these are having in terms of people, you can see people coming up to these and hugging them. You can see them interacting with them and touching them. And it brings a, a sensory connection that's really quite extraordinary in the way that this has played out. So it is art that's making a big difference there. And we have a small clip from John Gertie showing you a little bit about how he goes about doing this work. Again, the voice of the artist. And I need to do the mouse through there. And it worked. For the Hall of Human Origins at the Smithsonian's Natural History Museum, paleo artist John Gertie sculpted a series of hominids, or early humans. Gertie and the Smithsonian curators chose poses that would reflect a signature characteristic of each species. A Homo erectus female is sculpted in mid-stride, carrying a dead antelope over her shoulder. A Homo heidelbergensis male squats next to an open fire, holding out a piece of meat. A Neanderthal female holds an animal hide in her teeth as she makes a piece of clothing. Gertie is now working on a model of Paranthropus boisei. As always, he starts with the fossil bones. Right here, this collection of things that look like granola. This is actually a partial skeleton from one individual. And believe it or not, that has a lot of information um, contained in it that tells us something about the proportions of these uh, critters. So for example, um, this flange that you see on this humerus, or upper arm bone, um, speaks volumes about the kind of musculature that this individual had on its arm it's because the mu muscle attachment sites are places where the muscles have stimulated bone growth and caused a rippling of the bone. So this flange, for example, um, tells you that, that a couple of the muscles of the arm were very well developed and those are these two right here. And you can see I've given them quite a bit, a bit of uh, development. The skull reveals a central feature of Paranthropus boisei. And basically, the species is a specialist in chewing tough vegetable food. And um, they have massive molars, like four times the size of ours, 
and they have bony crests to support, support very large chewing muscles on the skull. So we decided to have this individual pulling a tough root out of the ground. The, the contrast that's made between this uh, individual and our uh, hominids that are in our own ancestry living at the same time are sort of the path of the chewing machine and the path of the thinking machine. And this is the chewing machine. Anyway, you can see more about his work there, but do come and see it if you haven't seen it. It's quite remarkable. And this kind of forensic reconstruction art we use in contemporary cases and different galleries as well. And all the way to things that were there right now, this was one of the more interesting things um, that we did, the hyperbolic crochet coral reef. And I will confess publicly, and so Barbara knows it, that when this was first proposed, like two years ago, I said, we're going to do what? Um, I've had to, I've since been educated. Let me put it that way. I've become a big fan of the hyperbolic crochet coral reef. This is, uh, or actually was an exhibition, a temporary exhibition that just came down. But it was remarkable. It's at the back end of the Sand Ocean Hall. And the interesting thing here, of course, is we're talking about corals and coral um, uh, the importance of coral reefs and the threats to coral reefs through things like bleaching and ocean acidification. And this turns out to be a community project that involved more than 800 people that did the crochet of this particular reef here in the region. And it's quite a beautiful display. This started in Australia. They did smaller versions. This is the largest one we did. And here you can actually see this white patch here, which is the representation of coral bleaching, the thing that's actually going on there right now. And it was incredibly interesting to see how the kind of people that this would draw into the museum and how people connected to it. So I think art in some of these exhibitions does give us an opportunity to relate to different people and open their eyes and show them different perspectives based on the science, but looking at uh, other angles of examining this. And uh, just last week, we opened an exhibition that's also very popular, which is the Nature's Best Photography. Uh, back to these issues, these are some of the leafcutter ants, and there's some really quite extraordinary images. Come over and see them, but I'll just show you three of them. Uh, this is water, just a nice, wonderful image of a detail of water on a beach and a wave. Uh, or this, which I asked Jennifer and said, why did you pick that one? I said, I just thought it was beautiful. And uh, I'll give you a guess what that is. If you've seen the exhibit, you can't cheat, okay? Any clue what that is? Polar bear? Mm. Almost, close. These are the footprints of a wolf on, on the ice. And it's, these are incredible connections. And this exhibition that we do every year, it's incredible to see how popular it is, how people are there. And of course, photography these days has transformed the way we relate to this. And we can take it around and look at the world and explore it in different ways. Now, the other thing that we've done, and, and just to tell you what's coming up, is we're doing another exhibition that will open later this summer that's called More Than Meets the Eye. And it's about looking at multiple ways that we use at examining and studying nature. And uh, some of these are scientific methods that happen to be quite beautiful. Uh, for example, this is a fish skeleton. Uh, it turns out that fish biologists, to be able to study developmental biology, one of the things you need to understand is the developmental biology, the structure of the bones inside a fish. You can get baby fish and fish of different sizes and see how they change. And you can treat them. It's a clear and stain method. And uh, this is the kind of result that you get, these incredible images. And Len Parenti and some of her colleagues published a whole book, a catalog called Ichthyo, which shows you x-rays and different ways of looking inside some of the fish, which is really quite beautiful. And uh, I invite you to come and see that uh, in the fall. But the other thing that we've done is we've established a number of artist in residence fellowships across the Smithsonian. And they can apply to go anywhere. But what's been interesting is most of them are actually asking to go to the Museum of Natural History. And what they want to do is look at the collections for inspiration. I want to show you a few of the products of this artist in residence fellowship. Uh, this, for example, is. Uh, an artist that came and did an internship in our Department of Botany. Uh, um, and it turns out this was last year. And this was actually the display that was presented at the Renwick Gallery based on this. So you can see the details of the flora and the inspiration that came straight out of this uh, uh, internship at the museum. This is another one that's really interesting from Rachel Bertwick. Uh, looking at this, and you're wondering, what is this? Well. These are pigeons. 
And this whole installation is done around the story of one particular specimen at the museum that's very famous. It's called Martha. And Martha was the last passenger pigeon. It turns out we have the last passenger pigeon uh, at the museum. And 1914 will mark the centennial. But she was so inspired and so moved by the story of the extinction of one of these species that she developed this entire installation using Martha. And coming up soon, uh, when is it, Barbara? In September. OK. This is another installation that's coming up that I think will make the Hirshhorn nervous and envious. Uh, but this is uh, Wang. And what he's looking at, he actually came to do an internship there and work with Lynn Parenti, one of our archaeologists. And he is interested in the topic of bioluminescence. It turns out bioluminescence is key in the ocean. If you live in the mid-ocean, there's no light. Bioluminescence is the name of the game. That's how you communicate. And he was interested in this and using art and looking at different ways of showcasing this. And he's come up with some incredible explorations. Uh, couldn't that be at the Hirshhorn? It's really pretty amazing to see this exploration. It's going to be in the temporary exhibition gallery in the Ocean Hall. And most people say, I, I wouldn't come to a natural history museum to see art. But guess what? It is. And it's new ways of looking at this. And it's not just the artist, but I want to read to you a quote from Lynn Parenti, who is the ichthyologist, the scientist that host, hosted this artist. And she says, CJ is simply one of the most creative people I have ever met. His investigation of the creation of light by living things knew no bounds. He manipulated fixed specimens to see just where their light organs were and how they worked as readily as he reconfigured the commercial light sensors. He crossed the boundary between science and art by denying its existence. So please come and see it in the fall. Again, it should be a very interesting element. Now in closing, I just want to go back to the issue of looking at the nature around us can inspire us because there is so much art in nature. And, and many forms and shapes, this, for example, is a dinoflagellate from, the Caribou, from uh, our field station, Fort Pierce. It's a scanning electric microscope of a tiny, tiny planktonic organism. And we start looking at it, you say, oh my gosh, this is incredible. These are the fossil record has some incredible evidence. This is one of the collections there. But it is an object out there that we can look at in so many ways and where an artist can present the same thing in so many different elements to showcase and discover this world around us. And sometimes it's an issue of looking up close with different methods. And this is an image uh, from jade. Turns out if you look at jade and look at it in fine detail, this is the kind of structure, the, the structures that make up jade. And th in this case, this is work by um, Serena Sorensen at the museum. She's using a method called cathode cathodoluminescence, I almost got it right, uh, to highlight and to study the crystalline structures. Or if you look at these, I knew you were going to. This is calcophonite, which is another structure. It's a mineral structure found out there, a close-up detail. Of course, you can look at it and say, wow, I mean, these are incredible elements. And all I want to say is that we, not only our natural history have been out there, documenting this planet for the last 100 years, or 200 if you go back to the US Exploring Expedition. But through these collections, we're documenting the natural world, looking at the way people have documented the world, and hopefully inspiring visitors that come to the museum, and that will continue doing their work for generations to come. And just in closing, oh, that stayed there, OK. Let me just finish with a reference to the exhibition and the artists that were discussing as part of the series, Alexis Rockman, who I understand opened the series. I wasn't here for his talk. But of course, if you go up there, the other thing that I want to say is that art can, of course, push our boundaries and push our imagination. When you can look at it, and I, I really enjoyed looking at not only his work from Guyana, which just happens to be a place where we do a tremendous amount of work, but looking at new elements and looking at issues like climate change, where an artist can really take the basic elements of nature and the world around us and push our imagination pushes thinking, and hopefully bring about new thinking for society for the future. So thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. And if you have any questions, Jennifer and Barbara will take them.
Yes. And, and uh, uh, let me give one answer, and then I'll turn to a no. Barbara, you're passing on this one. OK, but no, but let me tell you, it actually happens every day and every week at the museum. Because I think it happens, the, the place, the, the first thing that comes to mind is the scientific illustrators that we have, people like Vishay Malikol and Alice Tangerini and others. Because one of the things that happens, of course, is when they're trying to give you this image and this detail of the species that they're looking at, they have a particular way of looking at it and honing in on particular details. And they so often find new things in the specimens that a scientist had completely missed. And it not only in many cases has led to describing completely new species that we thought were the same thing, but it's actually in some cases helped us shape our thinking about the relationship between different groups of organisms and the evolution of life on Earth. And I could, I mean, I've run into that multiple times in the time of being at the museum. That's the first thing that comes to mind that's probably most prevalent in the museum. Yes, in the back, with a beautiful shawl. <laughs> yeah, I think if you could use a microphone, that would be helpful because we are webcasting this. I know that Alexis Rockman has done a lot to anticipate uh, the evils of climate change. And I believe that you had an exhibition, it may still be up on the coral reef, um, that was done, it was all crocheted. Correct? Yes. I wondered if you could speak a little bit from a science standpoint about what is happening to the reefs around the world and how you see that as a reflection of what's going on with climate change. So I could do a whole lecture just on that one question, but let me give you the short answer. Um, I mean, I think there is no doubt that Climate change is happening, and uh, the key issue is not whether it's happening, it's whether it's happening faster or not. Uh, the key issue, from our point of view, is the rate of change. And I think uh, there's clear consensus in the scientific community uh, that this is happening and that humans are playing a role. The other thing that's important is that we also know that climate change has happened multiple times in the history of the planet, not always human-induced. And when you look at the major transitions in evolution, there have been major periods where there have been massive impacts. And the fossil record gives us a window into the past, including reefs. So I'm going to come back to this issue. But as you look at it, there are many, many impacts of climate change in many different kinds of communities, whether it's plants at mountaintops or uh, edges of continents or others. But certainly, reefs are one of the most sensitive organisms there. Now, of course, coral reefs are very sensitive in that they live in a fairly narrow band of uh, water, I mean, a particular depth in that they rely on light to be able to do most of the photosynthesis. We actually know there are entire groups that are deep ocean corals now. But when we think about these corals, and of course, the, anything related, the impacts of climate change will probably be two that may have the biggest impact in terms of the reefs. Um, one, which most people talk about, is potential change, the changes in the sea level rise, which could have an impact there. And, and those will happen. They are happening. We know that there's been some changes. But the second one that's probably been less studied and discussed is the impact of what's called ocean acidification. And the issue there is that carbon, the, the CO2 in the air, will form acid. And the acid will impact anything that has a calcareous skeleton including coral reefs, but also planktonic life. And that is a real issue, because corals, if you have acid above a particular threshold, it will basically destroy the coral reefs. And that's probably a bigger threat than anything related to the changes in the, in the sea level rise. There are also fluctuations in temperature that happen. And if the water gets water, uh, hotter or not, the, what causes uh, bleaching, which I showed there on the reef, is actually when the water through things like El Nino years and others warms up too much, what happens is that coral actually releases the algae inside. And that's what leads to what you see when you see white is the calcareous structure of a coral. So there are many issues and I th that are happening and many potential consequences there. What is happening right now, I think uh, we know that uh, there are many parts of the world where we're seeing the impacts already. Bleaching has been massive, massive in many parts already. And I think uh, part of what we knew we can do as a Smithsonian institution is for many places like Panama, where I used to work, we have very good baseline data for some of these reefs. We can actually show 
and monitor the longer term changes and look at the science and how so these impact it without necessarily going to an environmental advocacy point of view. I think what gives us credibility is standing in the science and showcasing the impact. One last comment is, I think the best answers that we can get right now are going to come from the fossil record. Because it turns out there have been many periods like the Permian-Triassic extinction when all the reefs and everything that had uh, any kind of calcareous structure went extinct. Everything. Because of ocean acidification that was tied to global warming at that time. And it turns out evolution continued and reinvented some of these structures, but it has happened many times in the past. So sometimes it's really good to look back so we can understand where we're heading. That was more than one minute, but don't get me going on this. I can go on for a long time. Hi. Um, I was curious about the idea of the artist working with the scientist and um, a couple things. I guess, uh, do do you artists, because when you think about Alexis Rockman's work, it's pretty apocalyptic and not very positive from a future standpoint. So do you think that when artists work with scientists, they maybe, because they're getting the real science, they can think more positively, or maybe they get more depressed, because um, they, they see, oh, it's even worse than I was portraying. And then I was thinking on the scientist side, because I think people think, oh, science is going to be really heavy and complex, and I probably don't have enough training to read this paper or whatever. And do you think that the scientists can learn from the artists about how to communicate ideas? Um, so just two points I was curious about. So um, let, let me start with the second one. Uh, yes, I mean, I think certainly we can learn how to communicate ideas in many ways. and. Um, and I think, as I mentioned, cases like Human Origin, someone like John Gertie and the work that he did there, it's a really interesting, based on really solid science and, uh, and someone that understands the science, but can do some art that no panel, no video, nothing else that we've done would convey that relationship between some of these early human, humans or hominins, in this case, as some of those reconstructions. I mean, that's when we do an evaluation of the hall, that's one of the things that really strikes people. So, so, so absolutely, I think they can help us look at it. And by bringing art uh, into this, I think we can connect to people in different uh, ways. Now, in terms of the, the interaction, sort of the artists going in there, it's, it's interesting. We had a panel today at the Freer, last night and today, at the Freer and Sackler Galleries. And I was, we had a panel this morning. I was sitting there with, with Kerry Brower from the Hirshhorn, and he was talking about the artist and how you do this. And I was the scientist on the panel. One of the things that you're realizing is, of course, how different they are in many ways, although in that um, you're looking at, as scientists, we like to think of we're using the scientific method. We post a hypothesis. It has to be testable. We do peer-reviewed literature. But that's how science evolves. And, we, and the key is it's a community enterprise that builds on this and gets increasingly sophisticated over time. Um, I think in the art, you're looking, it's a very different issue there, where the, the, as someone put it in the panel this morning, the object is the knowledge. <laughs> it is that particular piece that it captions and looks at this. Now, would the, would the science influence the way the art is, looks at this object? Probably. Uh, I think it would. Would it be less or more pessimistic or optimistic? It depends on the artist and the scientist, to be candid. We have plenty of gloomy scientists, <laughs> um, but also some very optimistic ones. But I think what the scientists can always do is sort of showcase, just point out certain things that maybe an artist wouldn't have looked at. And then there can be a very constructive dialogue. And I think that's what we see every day. And that, that's what's interesting. Uh, we are experimenting this. And people like Barbara Stauffer deserve a lot of credit for leading us in this direction. Interesting new waters for us in some ways. But uh, I think it's working well. Do you want to add anything, Barbara, since you're here?
further exploring and further deepening this concern that he has and trying to document that in an artistic way. And actually, Joanna kind of manages the whole process, so if you want to chime in. Anything you'd like to add? I, you know, I, I, I think everything that Barbara and Christiane have mentioned um, is, is true, that this is, this is a really new area for us at the Smithsonian, this um, uh, collaboration between the science and the art museums, and we've seen how fruitful uh, it is for, for the artists who come and, and participate in the fellowship program to, to work with the scientists, um, and we expected that outcome. But um, what's been even more rewarding and what I think is really driving the, the program forward is the responses we're getting from scientists and other researchers across the Smithsonian, not just at Natural History, but at Air and Space, at American History, all the units, um, who say that their own research is being fueled by the conversations they're having with the artists. And while um, it, it just sort of opens, their, opens up their thinking about their niche subject. And I think that that's been fascinating also to hear from, from the researchers here at the Smithsonian. OK, any others? Back here. Yeah. Dr. Samper, you spoke of how, uh, well, one of the questions related to how art can help teach people about science. And um, back at the institution that uh, you and I shared, the uh, Tropical Agriculture Research and Higher Education Center, Katie in Costa Rica, there's a botanical garden. And recently, uh, the trees, a couple of the trees, have been painted. You, you showed us some slides of art in nature. Well, this is art on nature. And uh, this is a, a Seba tree, the sacred tree of the Maya. And it shows how the Mayan people emerged from the underworld and how the, the canopy of the tree uh, relates to the upper world and, and that we're in between. And, and so this is, uh, this is something that some people have found very inspiring. Others find it very troubling because this is a tree uh, in nature and someone has put art, some view it as graffiti, upon uh, nature itself. So I just wanted to ask if there have been any controversies in any of the projects that you've uh, been involved in at the intersection between art and science. Uh, uh, has anybody felt that uh, what's being done is perhaps inappropriate? Not that I'm aware of off the top of my mind. Uh, we've had plenty of controversies over other issues, like <laughs> labels or certain areas, but, but not on the art that we've used there. And that's an interesting, it's an interesting question. But we may run into it. I mean, some of the things that we're doing right now is, um, are, are going to push this. And, and not all of it is that comfortable. I mean, for scientists, back to the question of different ways of thinking and seeing, uh, for scientists that have a very structured way, sort of even putting a crochet reef on the, in the ocean hall was interesting. I, mean, I confess my own reaction was, what? It wasn't obvious to me. Um, and there are other scientists that may say, you know what, we shouldn't be doing art in here because this is a temple for science. And, but we, we haven't, uh, certainly nothing that surfaced to my attention or that's hit the front page of the post or anything like that in this particular case. But you know, you mentioned botanic gardens as a botanist, which is my training. I, I love gardens, and you and I have been in the one in Katia and others, but one of the things that's been interesting is to see the phenomenon of things like the Chihuly uh, last works in botanic gardens, which have been incredible. I mean, if you've seen them, I find them inspiration, putting, putting the art right there in the middle of this and uh, of a botanic garden, and, and I think it's a very interesting example. Um, I think some of us would have a problem, and I have a problem personally sometimes, when you see some artists taking nature or certain elements of nature f just for the art. Um, and it's been controversial in some cases. I mean, whether you're going to tell me that we're going to end up using an endangered species to make an artistic point, I say, do it with something else. I mean, leave the species alone. And that's the, so it, that's a dialogue where I think there are some places where there are going to be some interesting tensions. but. Um, it's interesting to explore those boundaries and see where they take us. 
I may give you a very different answer in one or two years, but <laughs> let's see how these work out. But Okay, anything else? Oh, Dr. Samper, I just want to say thank you so much for such a great talk and um, you know and for closing out this series, the final part of science lecture, but I hope you enjoy the conversation that continues here at American Art and obviously at National History. Um, but I wanted to close with one final question to bring it back to Alexis's um, first talk in this series. Um, something that he mentioned in his talk was what he admires most about the connection between artists and scientists is um, their, their interesting and different uses of creativity. So I was hoping you might have a comment or two about how you use creativity in your work as uh, the director of a national museum and a botanist, biologist, scientist, and, um, and how it's helped you in your line of work. You know, my definition, when people ask me sort of what's a scientist, uh, I can give you sort of the academic definition of the scientific method, but another way of putting it that I sometimes say it's uh, usually the best scientists or most of us that do science are people that have a kid that never grew up inside us. And that part of what we're doing is always asking questions. That's what fuels us. It's what's out there. It's like my five-year-old daughter and everything, all the questions she asked me in Rock Creek Park every weekend. Uh, well the best scientists continue asking those questions for the rest of their life. And I think it is looking at that and posing questions about this and continuously looking at the world around us and trying to understand it that does it. So, so certainly curiosity and, uh, and that kind of inspiration is fundamental to, to the work that we always do. And I think what's interesting, as someone like Lynn Parenti mentions there, is that that dialogue, as scientists, sometimes we get stuck in our own particular ways or of looking at the world. I think sometimes had that dialogue with an artist or a historian or someone else can really stretch us in new directions or show us new ways of looking at that world around us. So I think there is room for creativity. In terms of my role more as a director, I think it's making sure that we have a, a place where those kinds of inquiries can take place, for letting people pursue crazy ideas. Um, like the hyperbolic crochet reef <laughs> and other things like that. Um, and I can guarantee you that probably some of my predecessors would not have had the crochet reef there. And um, it's there, and I think it served us well. And uh, hopefully we can continue doing this. And let me say, just in closing, that uh, I do want to thank Sam for holding this series and for the invitation. I mean, just the fact of having some of us scientists come here to an art museum and talk about this is really great. The same way we're inviting some artists into natural history. And I'm sure this will help us understand, in our view, understand the natural world and our place in it much better. So thank you all, and thank all of you for braving the storms and potential tornadoes tonight. Get home safely. <laughs>